but the word accept the word acceptance he used Reese is is a big one and a big one for me really because it was wasn't until I accepted that I have this and it's always going to be there and even accepted that I had taken an overdose and was able to say I've actually I took an overdose because I wanted to die yeah it was when I was able to do that that everything almost became easier for me I was like okay this did happen yeah. but I don't have to be fully um, it doesn't have to hold me back that was Brad Fleming and welcome back to another edition of the Harris Health and Mind podcast what's up guys welcome back to the Harris Health and Mind podcast today's guest is Bradley Fleming um, known Brad since we was in college together playing football. Um, Brad's coming on to the show today to speak about basically his story. And um, yeah, welcome on, Brad. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Um, yeah, so I just want to dive into everything today um, and just, yeah, speak about upbringing, um, everything from, you know, youngster age to, to now, really. And, you know, what was your life like growing up? sports everything what sort of process did you go through um and yeah yeah there's a, there's a lot to talk about <laughs> yeah i'm excited mate you got you got a lot of time so let's get into it um yes i mean obviously we met at college and the whole football thing yeah um well, this was eight eight nine eight nine years ago now yes so it's a long time getting old Reese. getting old um but yeah i mean growing up you could say the normal normal upbringing um, probably better off than normal. I was very fortunate. I was travelled a lot when I was young. Um, my mum with my mum back and forth to Grenada, which is well, she was born here, but that's basically her home. Yeah, I travelled a lot back and forth with her, so I've I had a good childhood, good upbringing. Um, and with my mum and my stepdad. Um, yeah, I can't really say I've got no. No bad things about nah, my childhood. That's good. That's good to hear, mate. Some some people always have some little things, I guess, to say in childhood. But nah, that's good. Well, um, I want to dive into everything today because we're sort of going to get onto the topic in terms of um, anxiety, depression, um, yeah. sort of that side of uh, the coin. Um, I just like to start off by saying before we get started that I myself am not, um, you know, a fully qualified mental health practitioner um we're sort of talking um about our um stories of life i guess you could say and um our challenges in life and and obviously everything we've gone through and um we'll dive into little bits of research myself and and brad um and also brad in terms of him being in this field and um and having um his own upbringing struggles um he can obviously testify to certain things as well so um those that are listening in um what would you say brad in terms of if they're listening into something and they say oh i may have this trigger um you know um but brad or reese has said something should they take this word for it or would you suggest them uh to go and you know the next point of call what would you suggest i think um first of all i want to say that probably some things that might be said in the next hour or so um, could be potentially triggering for people who mm. are suffering with depression or things. But um, yeah, it's just going to be an honest sort of open conversation about my experiences. But if you hear something that I say and you think, oh, that might, that I recognise that, or I recognise that symptom or things, um, the first thing, go to your GP. Mm. If you say you're you're struggling with, you've been low for a long time, or um, you're anxious to the point where it's stopping you doing things, go to the GP because then you're in the system. Yeah. Um, it might not be the best system in the world, um, which we'll get onto a bit more. Everyone's got their faults. Yeah. Like that. Um, um, and and speak to people. Mm. Don't you speak to anyone though, because sometimes you need to find the person who will actually listen to you. Yeah, I think that yeah, that's what you said there. The key is to listen. I think yeah, hundred percent. Because I think um, there's a lot of uh, promotion of um, 
open, be open, or especially amongst men, like you see yeah. these tribes now, um, be open and talk. Um, but I feel sometimes you could be talking to the wrong person and you don't get the uh, the benefit from that that you could if you were talking to someone who was open, empathetic and receptive. 100%. So yeah, that would be the two things. I'd be find the right person, um, which is not always easy. No. You might have some people that you go to and you think they're going to be the right person, um, but they might not be. Um, but also at the end, I'll have I've got a few sort of numbers and things that I'd want to give out and hundred percent just yeah. to people, just you know, other other ideas because some people haven't got um, people close to them that they can talk to, or that they feel comfortable talking to. Of course, that, yeah, I think the key thing to take from that is definitely the listening. Um, find someone who will listen, and also. Um, Maybe as well do a little bit of research. I wouldn't yeah, say I, I wouldn't say over research it because sometimes that can trigger that um, mm. anxiety in you know if you've got depression or even you know serious states of anxiety. I think over research and sometimes when specifically if you don't have people to speak to that are listening and that can also give you some advice. I think that can be a little bit of a over trigger and um, you know bring on more things so definitely 100%. do a little bit of research you don't need to dive too much into it but no. I think um, being able to sort of understand yeah. what's maybe going on um, can make things a bit easier and having I think some sort of understanding if you're also going to your GP you can also say then um, these are uh, the potential things I'm struggling with. Um, I've done this sort of research this into this then they can sort of come from the angle of okay it's you know, it may be a particular area that we need to focus on yeah. here or, you know, dive into that field. So, yeah, for sure. So people that are listening in, um, obviously, yeah, um, stay stay listening and stay tuned because Brad's going to give out a lot of very, very good information. Well, um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> nah, even speaking to you off air, there's, yeah, there's loads of things that 100% people can take on board, 100%. Um, just sort of getting into the early stages, I want to mm. speak about how although loads of people and I 100% agree with and I'm in this field that um, sports is such a great tool um, and an advocate for obviously releasing a lot of stress um, in the body. Um, what's your take on, I'm going to get into it quite specifically with football, what's yep. your take on um, football from an early age maybe producing um, anxiety in children? Um, I think it's uh, uh, something that happens 100%. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, like yourself came up in well Colchester United Centre yeah. of Excellence Academy wherever it might be seeing people around that um, got released um, the football environment I guess is probably improving now but it was a very sort of um, is manly the right word? Um, very, yeah very it was very the, anyway the coaches that I had or were around me apart from a few um, probably didn't know really how to speak to a eleven year old boy to tell them that mm. their dream of you know being a footballer is being put on hold. And uh, I remember I have one close friend. I remember when he got told about him being released. We used to travel up to Colchester together, and he was yeah in bits, mm. crying tears that, that that the dream was over. Not that he was told in a way that it's still possible to come back. And you know, work yeah, and get there. It's it's not, it's not your last shot. You're eleven. No, yeah, you're eleven <laughs> you're years old. You're, you're 11, eleven, twelve years old. Um, Just and, started out in the game. But at that moment, it felt like everything was was shattered. Mm. I mean, at twelve years old, what is that all about? And it was that moment, or just before that, or after that. I, um, at being a coach at that time, I left because mm. there was just too much pressure, and I wanted to play with my friends. Yeah, which. Um, I was fortunate enough that I had my mum and my stepdad were like, well, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, so I think pressure can also come from family. Of course. I, lot within football. Yeah, I think the football's so vast as well and so broad, like you're speaking on the parts there where it's sort of like the ugly side in terms mm. of, right, it's decision whether you're under 11s, are we going to give you a two-year deal? Or if you're under 14s, are you going to get a two-year deal to go into 16s or 16s to get a scholar? Probably, yeah. Those sorts of things um, can definitely bring it on. In terms of just like everyday coaching, um, so not even necessarily in a youth setup, mm -hmm. I'm talking maybe more in terms of where there's going to be hundreds of thousands of kids that play in Sunday league football, I, I think a lot of that can come down from the coaches. Not even I'm not talking about the ones that are 
um, you know, parent coaches or, you know, parents of the teams, um, coaching aside, I'm talking about, you know, coaches that have gone and got their badges. Um, I, I think from what I've seen in the last few years, you I, you can see it in the kids. There's a lot of fear of making mistakes. Yeah. And like you're talking about, that pressure comes into it. Mm-hmm. Do, I, do I have, it's not all about now, maybe when we were playing, it was, you know, you could probably look back and say it's the pressure of the parents and you always see that. But I think you look at, uh, I've seen, I've gone to games where I've coached clients and, you know, uh, and their parents are like, you need to help me bring confidence back into the kid. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing this kid and I'm like, they're very confident. What well, You know, I don't I don't see it. And then when I go to their games, I'm hearing their coaches shouting and screaming because they miss from eight yards out. And yeah. I think you, you can't expect to, whether you're 16, 18, 12 9 7 you can't expect someone how how can you physically expect someone to react in a positive manner when all they're trying to do is hit the back of the net from eight yards out exactly and you know what if we bring it back to something that's relevant right now manchester united yeah right is the th- it, it works from an adult all the, from a child all the way down yeah. all, all the ways confidence can be zapped out of you by someone who Basically, if you don't, they don't think they believe in you, or they're shouting at you when you've done something wrong. Mm. Um, for example, going on tours abroad, probably went with Colin and yeah, went with Colin. When we went to um, Holland, the coaching was in a way that if you made a mistake, it was okay mm. because you're, you're, you're you've got to try these things. You don't get to the Messi didn't become well, maybe Messi might be a bit he's just unbelievable, but some Ronaldo, for example, didn't become Ronaldo by not making mistakes. You are going to make mistakes, but you don't. You can't be shut down constantly and constantly. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. That's fine, go on, man. Having, having someone um, having a go at you on the sideline, especially like you said, your clients, you know what they're like, and they're quite a completely different person in an environment. That environment's mm. not healthy. And I think it's also, it's a difficult one because also you need to understand, I think it's understanding the needs of the certain individual as yeah, well, isn't 100%. it? Like, and you can yep. talk about you know, Manchester United and um, Jose Mourinho and stuff as an example, Mm. because clearly whether he's gone in there, first of all, and said, this is me, this is the style of play that I want. I might be quite pragmatic. I might be quite aggressive in my style. I might go out in the media and say that I don't believe in my players. I need more players, but I trust you like a hundred percent, you know, we're in this together. I think if he would have gone from that standpoint, which I'm assuming, again, assumptions of the mother of all fuck ups. <laughs> I think that's another one from the car. Um, I'm assuming he's gone in and he's probably just, you know, ego's gotten away. Right, I've won X amount of titles. I'm going to do mm-hmm. exactly the same here. He's probably not gone in and been putting an arm around certain players that need the confidence or said, I trust you 100% um, to their face. I might, you know, back you off in the media, but you know, you're my guy or you guys are my team. He's obviously gone in and, you know, slammed the whole team. And you can see with the, every squad yeah, player that comes in, every Rashford, squad Rashford player that see the other moment comes think, in and plays. Yeah. You're just like, you know, you're killing this player's confidence and you need to think about what you're doing. And a in, lot of people don't. Individuality is definitely what, in, in form of coaching, you've got to understand every different play, every player. Every mm. player is different. You're not going to walk down the street and speak to everyone the same way, even within your own family. No. You, know, you can speak to one person one way. You might be able to have a bit of a laugh with, say, one brother, and the other brother, yeah. you know, you can't say that to him because they'll like, punch you in the head or something. Mm. So it's the same when it comes to like in football. Yeah. I've, also, as well, I think the the key thing for some listeners, you know, some people will turn around and go, well, are you trying to say that? you know you can't have a go at anyone now or people can't make, you know yeah. everyone has to make mistakes and no one's going to care if you make mistakes i think that's different and um there was a there was a clip the other day that i saw from the nfl which was quite interesting to be fair there was two pros sitting on the on the bench or on the bleacher as they call it yeah. and um they're one of their coaches again because they have like five six different coaches and formation coaches in the nfl shouting and screaming this information at the two players and the video's gone zooming straight into the two and instead of the two sitting there and looking away or you know having their head in their hands or yeah. looking frustrated or you know mad they were looking at their coach nodding he was shouting and screaming the information so i think there's also ways that the way that you handle the individual people can actually take on that information 
if it even does come ag- across to certain individuals the watching on the TV it. as yeah. aggressive, people can actually take that information on. But I think there's the process at the start that you need to address first, like you said, understanding the individual. Because mm. if you know that individual can take a little bit of criticism or can take someone getting at you aggressively, and they need that, yeah, yeah, and they need that in their games. Those two players might go on and absolutely smash someone or get a winning play from that, and mm-hmm. they've needed that, and their coaches understood that. Whereas I think some people sometimes I think think it either has to be right, no shouting at the individual or literally literally just making loads of mistakes and no one cares and football's all sunshine and roses mm. i think there's the balance and like you say it's getting that in between which is key yeah for me yeah. anyway everyone's everyone's uh things that motivate them are different mm. exactly what you're saying some people need a, a good shouting at to get them going some people need the arm around the shoulder and be like i believe in you mm. two completely different sides of the coin but to get the best performance out of that individual yeah it's an interesting one. There you go. He's got yeah. a little cough I'm trying, coming. I'm trying to keep the cough coming. Nah. I had this cough for about three months. There okay, you go. I'm, I'm good. No, you're good. Um, so, yeah, obviously, speaking on that side in, in football, I think for me personally, it's what what would you say in terms of um, people listening and maybe thinking, actually, do you know what? I am maybe a bit harsh on my kids um, that I'm coaching. How, how do I? you know, tailor that back or how do I, what's for me, what's the next process and how, how do I do it? What would your advice be on that? If they're listening and they um, say, do you know what? Yeah. You know, I need to change my ways. Uh, I think the, the first thing to, well, not the first thing, one thing you've got to do is communicate with each, each one of your, the children that you're coaching mm. um, children, teenagers, whatever age they might be, um, get to know them. Yes. You're there to be before football, mm. but, you think of that age that are spending a lot of time with you as a an adult around that around two hours a week four hours a week wherever it might be mm. get to know them as a person 100 percent. and once you get to know them as a person you'll understand what motivates them and it's just it's nice it's being friendly the thing is it's so stupid that it's literally it's, it's quite a simple thing everyone wants to be loved oh yeah of course they it's do. so simple like everyone wants to be if you can like you say, understand that individual and that person. You know, if, you, if you've taken that time, you know when they've come to training mm-hmm. and they've got a face on them, you know, right, I either, depending on that character, I either need to then build things up slowly with that individual yep. or I need to then go out. That individual might be showing signs where they want you to come over and, you know, ask. Because yeah. yeah, yeah. people, you know, they might not have anyone. So their body language will tell you and the individuality will tell you, right, you know, someone come over ask me how am I how you, you know yeah. and it's just that simple thing uh, how you didn't say you know you don't have to be like you look down today what's going on <laughs> yeah. like it's the way you approach it you know you might be it might be the you're doing a drill and they've smashed a shot wide and you're jogging over to get a ball and you just go oh, you know how you doing today little Johnny mm. you know you look a little bit down like do you want to speak about anything or you know what's playing on your mind or whatever like, I think it's the way you approach it and if you settle with it and you can understand them massively helps definitely because it's, it's a for for a child you've got you've got your teachers who are an authoritative figure you've got your parents who are an authoritative figure and sometimes that child might not feel they can talk even mm. if it's just about football to their parents or the teacher or whatever it might be but football's a little bit different yeah it's the easier to ease everyone's talking and socializing it's a little bit easier to maybe get something off your chest even about football yeah. for them to for you to say Oh, well, even say you said it's about the, the kid missing the shot. Instead of going, that was shit, Johnny. Yeah. Maybe don't say that to an eight-year-old, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> good, good advice, first off. <laughs> <laughs> um, say, ask them, what do you feel you did wrong? Why did you do that? What, mm. Why didn't you take the touch? And then open up that dialogue that way. Mm. Rather but, than, um, rather than yeah, just getting onto them too but much. I think- that's such a good point you raise there because also you're asking the question and it's getting them to trigger a thought like, okay, why did I take the shot? Did I rush? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I, you know, could I have taken a touch? Could I have switched it onto my other foot? And then also, it's, there's then comes in the learning phase for them because yes. you're asking them, you're creating that dialogue between them, you're creating that thought process and then hopefully the next time that may arise, they've thought about it because you've asked them that question. Whereas if you go straight into it and you're like, miss a shot, all the thing that's going to come up on the next time is, 
can't miss, can't, can't miss, miss, can't miss, can't miss. And then all that pressure comes in and the stress comes in and then people will either go for a safe shot mm-hmm. or they'll either over put their foot through the ball and, you know, whatever happened will happen next. And it comes the, the negative of can't miss rather than what can I do to score. Yeah, and then you're not learning because you're just putting your foot through the ball and you're hoping mm-hmm. as opposed to, okay, we've, the coach has pulled me out or whatever or after the game said, why'd you take a touch there? You know, or, you know, what could you have done better? And then you're creating that thought process or even may, may simulate it in training for you. And then it comes up in a game and then there becomes the learning if you're receptive to that as the individual. And again, both fields from the coach. So Within the, the learning, it's about, um, you will hear this term intelligent footballers. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, you say intelligent footballers. But a lot of, I think a lot of, um, if you want to say the intelligence is coached out of people. 100%. Because they're not allowed to make the mistake to learn or they learn and then it's, you need to do this, not... Mm. what did you do let's have a discussion about it yeah what could you do it's do this do that that's it and i think it's that coaching is you hear it loads of times as well but i think it is so i think it is simple when you break everything down yeah when you literally break everything down and you could say right what would i like to get out of this session with my group of 15 year olds what are they going to get from this session that I put in and then the rest of it what mistakes are they going to make but it's not even you're listing anything. It's okay, cool. They can make mistakes in this drill. Cool, they can do this in this drill. It's not a sense of, right, this has to be structured. A lot of coaches now, I think, um, and especially in academies, a lot of coaches, they have to do so many session plans and write so many things mm-hmm. out. And it's almost like you're over-structurating the, the session and it's planned to a T when even if it does go right, you, you almost feel like it's nothing's going right. Yeah. Because yeah. you're you want so much out of it and you can't, you're not allowing any, you know, chance for mistakes or freedom or, you know, creativity in it, which I think as kids as well is crazy. If, you know, you're going to structured sessions the whole time and you can't express yourself. I, I am. Um, it's funny. I'd say my, f- until the age of about 14, 15, when I, I went back to Colchester yeah. at the time, I was like, okay, I'm ready to try this whole football thing. Mm. Um, and I was, a few of my friends, I was very, um, I would try things, I would do things that were ridiculous mm. because I could. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, of yeah. course. I know that sounds yeah, um, cocky, but at that age, you do things and you could. But then when I back, got back, went back to Colchester and that rigidity came back, um, my confidence went through the floor mm. because there was, I had to do this, this X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, um, playing as a striker. I had to drop deep into the hole to get the ball to play it off. Yeah. I couldn't do that running behind into the channel or get the ball and turn and run because there wasn't the sport. The phase had to play to the exact yeah. phase of play. And That's what two or three phases of play yeah. at the age of 16 and or 15, 16. And I'm like, but what I want to do naturally, I wasn't allowed to do and mm. express. And I remember from probably from the age of about, 15 race I don't think I've taken a player on since no I was just about to bring that up because you see that now and I watch and you watch games I don't know how many players now coming through the system or not even necessarily coming through the system players that are 22 23 upwards Mm. I don't know how many players now are wingers I haven't seen I haven't seen a winger in wingers gone from the game in years in terms of someone like an Iron Robin when he burst on the scene or even a Damien Duff where you get you know you get the ball dribble at someone a little shift or a little step over shift cross even Joe Cole yeah Yeah, Joe Cole but I haven't I I think you're like you say you make such a good point of coaching that out of players I Mm. think we're creating especially now with obviously Pep coming and, and the whole passing regime and I think that's great for the game and a massive advocate the way he plays but he's also an advocate of players making mistakes as well yes. which is yeah. key um, but I think some clubs and especially at the youth level you see it now I go to so many and I've played so many games where you know at Sudbury we played like Ipswich you know under 18s and under 23s mm. and it's so much get the ball back from the keeper pass 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 but even the wingers that you're facing they're not wingers anymore they're not they're, gonna run they, at you. They're drifting yeah, yeah, yeah. inside, and when they drift inside, it's they pass the ball. Or there's so many times where you're you're three quarters up the pitch, and you think you you expect someone who's in that position of a winger or an attacking player to beat you. It's right. I'll go back. Yeah. I'll just pass back. But not even like I'm gonna pass back and and make a um, a five yard 
um, creative movement to try and get the ball again, like old school wingers would do, or maybe create space to, you know, have a bit more space for me to then dribble at the defender. No, it's literally, yeah, I'll just pass the ball back and jog or stand still, waiting for the next phase of play. And it's so frustrating to watch because I think it's monotonous where almost that it's in the head mm-hmm. where they get to a certain point in the pitch and it's like, right, we've been coached this and training, let's pass back. No, I've got to pass that in there, yeah. I like, can't lose the ball. And it's so frustrating. I think, like you say, you raise such a good point. When you come out of that little academy like structure or setup, or mm-hmm. well, not necessarily just academy, I guess, maybe places where you're not enjoying it or it's monotonous, yeah. and then you go into enjoying it again and happy that you make mistakes or the level might not be as good, but you're enjoying it, so you're being more creative and more free, mm-hmm. you find so much more joy in that because it's like, right, this is actually what I actually did like doing when I was six, seven years old or whenever I first started. 100%. And talking about the wingers, just wanted to put this, you, you're the team, I was able to play in with you like you're a year older than me sometimes. Yeah. Um, you got to the like the semi-final, the national semi-finals yeah. by passing the ball to you. You You going down the wing, crossing it in. Yeah. And one of the strikers bend, when they're yeah. bends in there, putting bends it in, in or Sam's in yeah. there, putting it in. It works. Mm. I know. Yes, the passing football is brilliant and things, but we we have lost a part of the of the game mm. for sure. And I think that yeah, that definitely does need to change. But you know, that's that's for other people, I guess. That's not for us. To, <laughs> you know, we could we could debate it. It's just, it. An, it's just our opinion, it. isn't it? Yeah, it's just just the opinion of yeah. two boys in Colchester. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess uh, I guess I guess Mourinho and things they've they've done a bit better than us in the coaching game. Yeah, well, just for, only yeah. for now though. Just a little hey, bit, yeah. Just Reece. a little bit, Mourinho. Yeah. We're catching you. We're catching you. Who, who knows? Who What's knows, he won mate? in the last year, eh? Exactly. Yeah, what have <laughs> I won in the last year? Nothing, Mourinho. <laughs> we're level, mate. We're level. Don't worry about that. It's a pass the pass. Starting we're level, from mate. the same point. That's what I mean. Only as good as your last job, mate. Only as good as your last job. 2019. We're both on even playing fields, Mourinho. I'm coming for you. Now. um yeah, no, so that's, yeah, that, that, I think that's a good point to raise. And, um, yeah, and, mate, football's always changing. And I guess that's that's part of the game. We've, yeah, it's um, evolving. Everything evolves, isn't it? You know, and I guess as we're getting older, we're going to probably sound like to people that are listening that are much younger than us that are like, oh my God, like, you know, what are you, what are you trying to ruin the game for? <laughs> like, they've already yeah. went around. Moved on. What is this? Yeah, Just but, like we're like, we go back and we're talking about. Uh, Victorian days, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think no, Messi's the greatest player of any, but you didn't see Maradona. Like, yeah, the old rubber know. ball. Yeah, right. well, not that old. <laughs> right, we're in. Nice little technical difficulty there. <laughs> <laughs> Had us going for ages. You tried everything, and literally, it's just. Um, <laughs> It was just a USB connection on the mic that actually messed up. So, uh, yeah, live and you learn, I guess. But hey, back got on. The end. Got there in the end. Nah, got there in the end. Sweet. Um, so, yeah, obviously the topic of conversation um, is sort of linking to anxiety, depression. Um, yeah. And, yeah, just sort of things that uh, you've gone through. When when was the first um, sign, I guess, um, you know, with your struggles with um, anxiety, depression and, you know, things like that? Um, it all... Also- started um i had a car accident mm. um i was on my way to um university one morning and um so it's, it's weird so i say it's a funny story it it's not but part of it is um a lorry stopped for a rabbit to cross the road um now if you drive you know that you really shouldn't stop for a rabbit definitely must have been a vegan <laughs> didn't want to kill did he didn't want to kill definitely I think that was the only logical explanation good man good man <laughs> the uh, uh, yeah Laurie stopped for this rabbit and um, actually my next door neighbour who had just recently moved in um, across the road from me was in the car ahead right. um, she stopped behind the lorry and then I came to a stop and then um, I was hit from behind by um, like a you know those mini white vans mm. um, somewhere between 40 and 50 miles an hour they reckon um, and then I was hit from behind again by another white van <laughs> which <laughs> <laughs> which so there was two white vans that didn't realise that it was time to stop mm. um, anyway so that happened um, I'll show you the pictures of what my car was like at the time yeah um, I was in shock really at the time and um my next door neighbour came and got me out of the car and uh, I was sitting sitting on the side of the road and you know people there's an accident everyone wants to have a look and see yeah, what's going course. on so it's like a uh, one way sort of six to one hour road so now going in the opposite direction um, people are looking to see what had happened Yeah. and there is now there's another accident a smaller one just someone's rolled into the back of someone 
Um, and then about five minutes later, there was another accident where someone had rolled into the back of someone Jesus. else looking. Anyway, um, I was in, um, I had pain, pain in my hip. I'd recently, not recently, a few years ago, I'd had an operation on my hip. Mm. But I was having pain in my hip um, straight afterwards and my, um, my back was sore as, as normal. You would get from whiplash injury. Um, and I was being sick, so they called the ambulance. Mm. Next neighbor called the ambulance for me. Anyway, the ambulance turned up, um, ready to book me in. And as they're doing that, a lady's come running up the road saying, somebody's come off their motorbike. Can you come down? Mm. Um, so obviously... I've uh, they've asked me because they basically they said once I've got you checked in we can't let you go. Yeah. They said do you mind if we go down? And I was like oh, of course of course yeah. you got to, of course <laughs> you're going down. Um, so we've gone. I'm in the back of the ambulance now. They've driven sort of through the traffic down. It's only about probably about 300 meters up the road. And what had happened found out subsequently is that where my accident had been and then everything else had sort of queued up where there'd been multiple accidents. Um, this guy had gone to do a U-turn to basically get out of the traffic. Yeah. As he'd gone to do a U-turn, a motorcyclist was coming up the outside and collided with the car, basically. Came off the motorbike, landed, I don't know, probably about 100 metres from when the actual collision was. Yeah. In the end, 100 metres might have been about 50 metres, probably. Yeah. It was a long Still, distance from where yeah. the car was, yeah. He'd come off and um, he was on the side of the road. And it just so happened that the way they positioned the ambulance was right next see. to where the body was, where his body was. And um, obviously they've opened the side doors to be able to get everything out. And um, unfortunately, they were working on him, but he he, was, but he died on the scene. Mm. Air ambulance came and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, I was in shock. And then, I was sort of witnessing everything going on with this this poor boy that had come off his motorbike, and um, it's just sort of, it was all a bit much, really. Yeah. Um, it wasn't how I expected my Wednesday morning to go. Um, anyway, the, another ambulance came and picked me up, um, and took me away. And uh, I was explaining to the woman in the ambulance that what had happened and things. Mm. And I said that he'd stopped for a rabbit, the, the lorry driver. And this was the funny bit. And I said, well, at least, you know, one benefit of this whole situation is that the rabbit um, survived and everything. And she said, oh, I don't think it did. No. And I was thinking, in this moment right now, let's just tell me. <laughs> yeah, just say the rabbit did <laughs> Just say to me, and... yeah. Just give me some positive news about this situation that had happened. Mm. Um but yeah, from it was that basically. Um, I was a, you know, I was a, I was a man. I don't, you, you're fine. You don't, it's, it's, you don't talk about your emotions about openly, emotions. No. and you don't let what's happened affect from the outside seeping into you from just typ Ex like yeah. typical standpoint of a of a traditional English man. Yeah, is exactly. Whatever happened to you, you you know, you deal take with on board. It. You yeah, deal you put with it yourself away. internally, and you carry you know, on with your life. Yeah, Nothing emotions happened. can't be shown. Exactly. Thanks very much. Um, so I was suffering from flashbacks to the incident. Mm. Um, so basically it was PTSD. Yeah. Um, flashbacks, couldn't sleep. Um, multiple different things going on. Sorry. Um, and I got to, I got to approximately a year and a bit after that. And I'd been sort of struggling with this all along. And the PTSD basically had turned into a, a, de a depression. Mm. which had subsequently got worse and worse and worse but so I, but I was hiding it better and better and better yeah um i mean this is something for people who it's funny i had a conversation with my mum this morning and um just like telling i knew i was coming on i was going to talk about things and mm. i was having a chat with her and she one of the things she said to me this morning which um she hadn't said to me before was that she felt to herself how didn't she know yeah and something that um, I tried to explain to her and I explained to other people that when you're going through these things, the struggle is there, but you can you can act, you can put on this act to the world. Yeah. So you can be, um, everyone will think you're perfectly fine, you live in a normal life, and then you sort of shut your door and then it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, that you can was... actually be, it's almost like when you go, wake up in the morning, go outside, you mask yourself in... Um 
everyday life i guess yep. going on social media post what you're doing for the day mm-hmm. um carry on i guess is your normal daily job and yeah, um, going into work is normal going into work functioning. You know, having conversations so people don't automatically go you know so oh, you know brad's not you know they don't have that conversation with anyone or someone exactly. like, do you think brad's all right today or yeah. it's almost like yeah cool every day is normal you know you seem fine and then i guess for you when you get back it is almost like that everything off your shoulder that it was probably you had it to release it and 100 percent. that was, must be yeah it was it was, i'd get into be once to only once i got into my sort of bedroom mm. i was at home got into my bedroom where i'd be like <coughs> yeah excuse me i can just let it did the cough as well did yeah you? did the cough as well <laughs> <laughs> you might hear that a few more times over yeah. the, course of the, the next hour or so but yeah just it was um the place where i could let it go but it built up and built up and built up mm. to a point where um i'd started to have thoughts of suicide basically mm. um without wanting to act on it to begin with and then it slowly progressively got worse and worse um and there was someone that we both knew mm. um i knew i knew i heard the situation not not someone i knew well mm. but that they had um died by um suicide mm. and it was like a trigger for me to um to say oh okay well if someone else I kn- that i know of can do it yeah i can do this like i can actually and then that's when i started actively planning on what i wanted to do yeah um and in that period um i hurt a lot of people close to me, around me, um, girlfriends, girlfriends. That was <laughs> no, you're gonna hurt my, them even more yeah, now after no, yeah, yeah. listening. Um, girlfriend, my, I think you meant at the time. Girlfriend at the time. Not um, I'm trying to think of the best way to word this. It was intentionally mm. so that when I did everything, it would be easier. Now, in in my clear thinking mind now, I realise that's absolutely stupid. Yeah. But in when I was in that moment, well, yeah, I guess you're in a place where you you probably got to a, almost like a final place, like you said in your head, where you've planned everything out and you almost want to. It's that release, isn't it? You want to release and you don't want to feel that pain every day or feel that you have to mask. You know, eight nine hours of the day, waking up, going out, acting like everything sunshine and roses and like you said, because us as males, we don't, when it's, it's not something that we're designed to as you've grown up, like express your emotions, no. go and tell, like, tell someone how you feel, no matter how bad it is. It's almost like, right, deal with it. And that's what you were doing. I think you got to that final point And like you said, you, unfortunately, we knew someone who, you know, did do that. And mm-hmm. that's almost triggered a place in your head where you think, right, oh, okay, if they've done that, I can do that. And you don't want to feel that pain. So no, it, yeah. it's almost like you've gone, okay, I, you know, I'm having thoughts of this. I don't want to feel this pain lifting and carry around this every day. This will be what's easier for me, for me to, do, to deal yeah, with. Yeah. And that that's a difficult situation for someone to grasp, like you're saying, when 100%. that, you know, that fully comes around and they're back to a clearer stage clearer of thought. State of mind. Uh, yeah, that it was, I, in my mind at the time, I felt it was easier for everybody else mm. if I just did did that. But I mean, I got to the stage. Um, my girlfriend at the time came and said to me, "Something's not quite. Something's not right with you. Mm. I understand you've you've hurt me, whatever. But this is not you." Yeah. And it was her in that. So this was the, the first sort of time I got really bad. Her and her sister actually, who sort of were the ones that actively said something's not right. Yeah. Started speaking to my mum about it and together i got therapy and things and got through that one Mm. um after that i decided that i wanted to go traveling yeah i was like this is how can i just get away from this whole situation again it's that whole escapism isn't it? oh yeah i mean it's it's it was what i did i didn't deal with the situation yeah it's not it's not necessarily you're not finding that root cause of um you know and it might have been for you that root cause is you thinking was that my fault of the whole crash and what led to, you know, the motorcycle. It's and <laughs> it's difficult because so many things uh, you can't control what that person did. So, so many people in that situation would sit in the traffic and wait. Yep. And 
so many times it may pan out differently that the guy does do a U-turn and there's no cars there and he just gets off. And, you know, but for you at the time, it was probably a case of you're going through, running through everything in your head and you're thinking it's something to do with you. And it, This didn't it, happen and this didn't happen mm. and that one. It's, it's actually really funny you said that because when I was sitting on the side of the road, there was this person in a lorry going in the opposite direction who shouted out, why don't you move your cars? Yeah. And that has always stuck in my head. Mm. And that, when I was going through the moments, it was almost like a guilt feeling yeah. that if I'd have moved the car and thing, and then that wouldn't have happened, and he'd still. But there were so many other. There's things so many that happened. Yeah, in, there's in so the many different consequences, isn't there? You exactly. don't know if that person um, was on their phone, wasn't paying attention. You know, there's so many different things that exactly. you could have. You, you probably won't even get to ever know as no. well. Um, and the two guys that hit you in the lorry, you don't know if both of them were on their phones, etc., or if they just weren't paying any attention, or if the brakes, you know, yep, yep. just weren't in terms of stoppage, it weren't right. There's so many different things that, you know, you can't sort of, you know, st- I know it's difficult, but you can't, you know, blame that you can't one, know. one it, thing. But it was in that in that moment of processing of how my brain was working at the yeah. time that I was bringing anything else that I could to put on top of me to make myself feel worse basically but don't you find that's such a that's such a weird thing as humans that we have it's such a an emotion for uh when we when we obviously express it the empathy the guilt um yeah. and the actual ability to have such a driven thought process into you again being alive and you coming out of that accident to then you putting almost all of the blame of that one guy's death on you is such a remarkable thing that we have as humans to go you know right i'm going to put all of this on me on me yeah and when you turn around and look at it you know there's i don't know how many other people were there but there's i'm sure there probably would have been a couple of hundred people there and it's so true and every every there were so many details after the my actual incident that led to that moment mm. um hundreds of thousands of decisions that hundreds of people made yeah which then led to that one decision um and what i've learned sort of going through different therapies and things is that thoughts don't actually mean anything, which I didn't at the time. Everything that popped into my head was definite, and it mm. was a hundred percent what was happening and what what uh, the best the way I had to feel about things. Yeah. Because what I've learned now is you can have a thought, but it doesn't mean anything until you act on that thought. Yeah, for sure. I think thoughts as well. Like you're, I think the weird thing about thoughts, I think you're always in control of your thought. I think mm-hmm. you've always got. Again, and that's where the acting might come into play. Um, and I guess maybe from um, a different standpoint on on thoughts, um, you know, if you wake up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not good enough every morning. Yes. That thought, or even not saying it specifically, but looking in the mirror and, and thinking it, that thought acts in, out in different ways, psychologically, emotionally, and, you know, physically as well. I think the f- we're always in control of... Uh, having a positive thought and a negative thought like you say I think it's the action that we take on that and also the positive action and the positive thoughts we give and reinforce ourselves can determine you know movement forwards but definitely it's um, I saw a, I saw something the other day it said smile in the mirror every morning mm. at yourself just because smiling increases the endorphins yeah I think you've also got to say good enough every morning mm-hmm. you know I am good enough we all want to be loved and especially for Say, uh, again I'm assuming but I'm saying majority of females in the morning probably look at themselves and uh, get themselves ready in the morning you know of makeup course. and whatever I mean I certainly um, do I have a good look in the mirror yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to make sure the hair's on point you know? yeah. <laughs> but I mean that's um, I think that's a massive key because you're looking at yourself and I think if you're looking yeah. at yourself you're you know you, it's reflective right back into what you see and mm-hmm. then Again, I think sometimes, especially first thing in the morning, is the phone. I think the amount of times we look in the, you know, look in the phone in the morning, and if you're in a negative thought process, and then you go on, again, social media as a tool, yep. and then you're then having thoughts of someone else having a better life than you, or what is perceived as a better life than you, then that thought starts dwindling in even more, and then you get into a mindset where you're even more, again, negative if if you was already in that state, but it's difficult because obviously we use them as a tool um but i do think yeah i agree with you you got you got to look yourself in the mor- mirror in the morning and say you know i am good enough and set sort of mantras or affirmations and positive affirmations you know, yeah set yourself up 100%. for the day 
because ultimately you're the you know you're the only one who is in control of your thoughts you know Ex- exterior no one else is it you know for as much as you might have an opinion on me or might say certain things to me or even if you you know you're negative towards me i am ultimately in control of my thought of what you're perceiving on me exactly it only affects me if, if I, I want it, it yeah, yeah. If I want it to affect me, and that's how we, you know, you look at it, and you can take, you can take it the other way, and you can turn around, and we can take on all the positives from what people say to us all the time. You can go into work, and your manager will say, "You've got the nicest style, the shoes that you have on, so good. You're so good looking. Your hair's amazing," and you can soak that up and yeah. take that all in. But it's also going to have a, a negative effect on you if you're not open to receive it in the other ways, and you're not yes. able to deal with it as well. Um, and I think it's just having that. Um, understanding i think of the thoughts so just having a little bit of a better understanding i think as men we probably don't have that as no, much I, th- I think um it's definitely getting better 100% um and it's really positive that it is getting better and there's more open talk about mm. feelings yeah um some people some people will always be negative towards it but you can't let that affect you and you've got to continue nah. doing what you're doing. I just wanted to, actually, you said about the, the social media first thing in the morning. Mm. If you're waking up in a negative mood or a negative mind frame and you go on social media and you start looking at everyone else's life, first of all, I just want to say this. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? But social media, when you look at somebody else's social media, that is not their real life. Mm. If you go on most of the time, it's what they want to portray to the world of their life mm. and what they want or and what they need to and want to sell as well definitely definitely but you are social media is selling this version of yourself mm. no one puts well some people do but really you get you won't get someone posting a picture of them on their way to work putting makeup on on the train in the way into work or mm. the man who's had a fight with his uh, with his wife the day before mm. you'll get the positive of oh look at us all happy on holiday together so you always see only positive things of other people and if you're waking up waking up in that negative mind frame you're always going to say why is that not happening to me mm. or i want that or why don't i have that holiday with that wife or that girlfriend or things yeah and that can affect you negatively that is a big thing of social media i had a period where you're looking at everyone else's life and thinking oh gosh so much better than mine but But then people look at mine and say Mm. but like you say and and, and like you said earlier and which was um you know such a good point and such a valid point for people that are listening you went out every day and masking everything that you were carrying on your shoulders Mm -hmm. for the whole day so you know you're doing that in your life and that's where social media comes into play in terms of it might not just be you walking out and actively seeing people face to face and masking something and Mm. carrying stuff Mm. but we're doing it with our phones or whatever platform we use we're doing it in pictures and captions to say look at me i'm having the sickest time whereas you might have just had an argument 10 minutes before that exactly you know you might just have been told very bad news just before that and or you know you're promoting something that you know you have nothing about but you're getting paid for it it's it's a cycle where i think you you can use it as a tool um but i think if you can be in control of it it's, exactly there, there it's are a lot of posi- there are a lot of positives to mm. to social media but you have to be aware of what it can can do yeah to people um we got off, went off track there didn't we but because i was talking about me going traveling <laughs> yeah sick mate sick time no traveling. it's good that it's good that you're just letting it flow when I went travelling recently it was to get away from honestly if I look back now it was to get away from all the situations that I had going on here mm. had an amazing time don't get me wrong yeah um, did New Zealand Australia Thailand met friends along the way did America Canada but it was a, to get away mm. and then um, what I did which I probably I found comfort in someone that I'd met whilst I was travelling in um, in New Zealand and a friend that still that was still friends got on really really well mm. and then got into some sort of a friendship that was it a friendship was it not a friendship yeah 
little TV like, drama. Sort yeah, yeah. Of thing. It was, it, I think it could if you have actually replayed the story, it would. Yeah. It would. It would beat EastEnders for ratings on a, <laughs> on a Friday <laughs> night. NTA, NTA award. <laughs> yeah. Um, and where I was in, I really wasn't in a position to be thinking about things like that. Mm. And I got involved and what happened was afterwards I left to come home for a friend's wedding hmm. and I would so actually I didn't say this I was put on medication after yeah. the first time I got really bad and um, I was put on a antidepressant called uh, sertraline yeah I was actually put on something called citalopram initially and that didn't resonate with me at all what um what sort of things didn't it resonate with moods um, or yeah so didn't help mood at all uh, I had side effects shaking legs um, palpitations couldn't mm. sleep I probably had about the most I had was about three hours sleep a night for yeah. two weeks it was and that sleep's important so oh, it's yeah. just cool. and when you start taking these things they always say you know it could get worse in the first couple of weeks or a month or so and I, that just didn't that one just didn't work with me mm. so anyway they put me onto this other one sertraline so I've been I was taking that the whole time I was away Mm. And then I was in New Zealand having a great time. Um, I'd actually, so I, after travelling, I went back to New Zealand to move there and work and things. Having a great time. I was like, in a good place and I stopped taking the medication mm. um, um, off my own back. Yeah. Didn't really speak to anyone about it, just stopped it. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'm fine now. I'm yeah. all good. Hadn't actually, actually dealt with any of my problems, really. No. But <laughs> um, fine, went back. And then I got home and my anxiety built up. Um, massively hugely like I hadn't had anxiety like it before and it grew and grew and grew to a point then the depression side of things came with it yeah and so this was come down to last September so last so September 2018 mm. I got to the point I t actually took a, a overdose on medication mm. consciously or consciously yeah I can it, it's um, I can fully being calm as anything I'd made the decision whereas I think the first time I was going through things it was sort of a build up and it was I knew what I wanted to do but there was still part of me that was still, still un yeah, yeah, still yeah. unsure uh, this time I just went and went and did it mm. uh, if I tell you I'll tell you the, the story basically when I'd started getting bad I said to my mum I was actually away with my mum my aunt was in a um a swimming competition mm. she's like an age group national swimmer and we'd gone to I think it was Budapest or somewhere and we, I was out there and I said to my mum I'm not good and we yeah. got we got back and after a few days of being back she took me took me to A&E because she was worried about me and this, if you're worried about someone's going to do yeah. something act or deliver a self-harm or something took me to A&E and I was there uh, sent home the next day and I had a psychiatrist come round along with somebody else and I remember this psychiatrist came round and he had no rapport build skills about him at all he was basically this man who just came into my house and said oh yeah you've got this um, take these take these tablets you'll be fine go and off then yeah. yeah go off the, these will mask yeah yeah and you'll be fine he's like this is this is this is normal nothing's wrong just take these you'll mm. be fine and basically give me a medication called quetiapine which is an antipsychotic but he'd given it to me as a dosage for sleep yeah, to help with my sleep because I wasn't sleeping very well at the time. Not something from what I've researched now and spoken to more people about that's really advised as much anymore. No. And it was once, when, when I was put on that medication, like any of these medications, they can make you worse. It was within a week of that medication that I had taken the overdose. Yeah. The night before I took... The other days, the day and night, I was with a group of my friends from university. Mm. And ever since, I've always found it a little bit difficult to be around them. Yeah, because it brings back that moment of when yeah. I was there. Emotion of yeah. emotion of, of of being there at that time. It, I was with them. They, literally, I'd fully planned that the next day I was leaving there, gonna and go home. Mm. And and take all the take all the medication that I had, but they wouldn't have known. It's just the, the ability to mask it again. again. Yeah. Even though when I was at home and my mum could see that I wasn't well and things, 
it was I said I'm gonna go to this event just to see how it was, but fully knowing yeah that tomorrow was coming and they didn't know anything. And actually, I fully admit that it's it's affected the relationship that we that my relationship with them, mm. um, not for any fault of their own, or it is literally just me struggling to dissociate that night before to the event of me actually taking the overdose. Of course, because that still brings back a certain amount of the again the pain of yeah. It's almost, this could be the final time with them yeah or this is about to be this the final to be. Yeah. time with them so i guess when you're around them now it's constantly a reminder of that time in your head where you was like okay this is even though you know, like, i'm very open now and i speak about it and i'm open about it i don't particularly like going back and thinking about it mm. um i'll talk about it and what's happened and my experiences because i want people to know that this does just happen to that normal person. Yeah. The 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 funny one or the you know yeah. the one who you wouldn't know about. Um you'd never think about it. But you don't simply like going back and thinking about it and sometimes when I'm with them it triggers that thinking cool. about yeah. it. Um so yeah, so the, I took I took the overdose and uh I remember sitting there on on sat on the side of my bed, took the medication and got into bed. Like just as you were about yeah, to fall asleep. Yeah, just about to fall asleep. And um, so that was, here's a funny fun. It was on World Suicide Prevention Day. Oh, really? It was the night of World Suicide Prevention Day. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't, it just, nah. I've, I've known that subsequently. And it was the night of World Suicide Prevention Day. And from, so this is a story that I've got back from my mum now. Mm. She found me in the morning. I was in the bathroom. For some, I have no recollection at all. Yeah. But I was in the bathroom and um, she called an ambulance and things. So I woke up, I think it was a Sunday night. So I woke up the Tuesday in hospital. Mm. And uh, obviously my mum was there and nurses and things and everyone. And then I might have been there for another day or so. And then I was sent home. But I was sent home without anything in place. So in terms of, imagine someone's just tried, attempted to suicide mm. and I was sent home without any therapy in place, without anyone to see for, um, to check my medication. Yeah. To, I was just sent home. No backstory to yeah. figure out what yeah. you was previously on to. I was just sent home, Reese. Mm. And then it was funny, after that I had so- someone who was the home treatment team and they came, so basically they'd come round someone would come around for like five, ten minutes just to chat to me and see how I'm doing and things. Yeah. And this is where the NHS is an amazing organisation. Everyone who works mm. within the NHS are doing it because they love, you know, helping people. Yeah. But the unfortunate thing is it's underfunded. So I would be there, this is like three days after I come home, waiting for this person to come round, this lady, and then she'd ring me and say, I can't make it today, it's going to be somebody else. Mm. So where I was just sort of building that rapport Rapport. with this lady, all of a sudden it was someone new. And then a day later after that, I get a phone call and say, no one's going to be able to make it today. Mm. And then you just sort of feel completely lost again. So so that one sort of thing I was looking forward to, not Mm. not even looking forward to, but that was the the only structure I had for the day. Yeah. This person's going to come round at between this time and this time. I've got to get myself out of bed and downstairs Mm. to talk to them, et cetera, et cetera. And then I just, that uncertainty and inconsistency made me start spiraling mm. again. And I got worse and worse and worse. And I'd actually seen a, a therapist privately for beforehand. And so my mum took me to see her again. And I was seeing her and she actually wanted to, she wanted to admit me into the, uh, into like a, on a psychiatric ward. Mm. But they weren't having it. The BHS said it wasn't bad enough. Yeah. Um, so what happened after that? The therapist I saw got me in contact with a psychiatrist who I went and saw. Luckily um, for me, from when I was a lot younger playing football, I've had f- three operations on my hips and both my knees done. Mm. So my body is broken. Um, yeah. But when my body started to break down, my... Um, 
my mum had got out of private health insurance for me. Mm-hmm. So that was able to fund my care, yeah. my, the psychiatric care that I needed. And it wasn't until I had my that sort of support network of the therapist and the psychiatrist together yeah. that I felt, okay, I can actually see a light out, a way out of this. Yeah, of course. Because I felt I had the support of these two people. I had the psychiatrist who, who was like, this is the plan. Mm-hmm. Not just someone who came around and said, just take these, you'll be fine. Yeah. He said, this is the plan. We're going to get you off that and just slowly work your way, mm. you know. Um, and my therapist were there to help me work through what the whole issues were. Yeah. All stemming from an initial car accident, mm. but had grown and worsened with other life events and things that had gone on along the way. Yeah. I think what you're saying there is really interesting in the sense that you felt that the path and you saw the light was definitely when you had the two of them working together yeah and I, sort of alluding back to earlier um again li- um in the football talk was mm. having someone that will listen to you as well and i think because you've had you've got those two people that are in place maybe they've got more time than the nhs they can yeah, really yeah, understand definitely. where you're coming from so they're putting a structure in place and they're probably talking to each other and liaising mm-hmm in okay we, I, I felt like this with brad today in terms of um his emotions or where he was coming from or what he was telling me yeah cool i felt this too or you know this is what we got to do to work things through and then they're then putting that trust in you as well because like yes. you were saying earlier you felt like you needed someone to come and see you in the initial stages of coming out and with the nhs someone maybe wouldn't be there or mm. they would mm-hmm. call and say someone else was there so you probably wasn't fully trusting that no. either the right person or the person you saw for two weeks would, would come and you were starting to build that rapport with someone that was listening to now having these two people in place that were listening had an idea of you know um what to do to try and help you mm-hmm. and were sort of guiding you and i think that's important for people to like say find whether that's privately through the nhs or through it's someone that's someone gone through that, that yeah. already yeah. and i think that is massively key and Again, can't stress enough, especially, obviously it's not just males, but especially males that don't really want to talk openly. Oh, yeah. um, because from what you're saying as well, um, a lot of the stuff that you've gone through, especially at the early stages, um, you probably didn't communicate. Um, no, if I'd have communicated, none of this would have happened. Well, not necessarily, this, none of this would have stage. happened, but it, yeah, it, it potentially would have got nipped earlier on yeah, or seen exactly. earlier on because someone would have said look he's he's saying this to me mm-hmm. i'm going to act on it and you know even if you do act on it it's for a good reason exactly. then at least someone else can come in and say actually yeah what he's saying you're right we do need to put this in place mm-hmm. or we do need to you know sit there and listen or take more care and more time into what the situation is arising and i think that's really important what would you say in terms of um it's a difficult one. I know we had this chat off air, but what would you say in terms of the antidepressant drugs? <coughs> um, because I was doing some research yesterday and according to um, uh, NHS Online, it's, it was around one in six women, 2017 study, that are on antidepressant drugs, which seems to me is, is quite a high amount. It's high. Um, would you say they are something that is and again i need to uh, something that is necessary in the early stages um or would you say that it's something that if everything else that you've tried afterwards then would you then say you know give it a try because like you said you've had a couple of experiences where these drugs wasn't working with you and they've switched and gone to this or changed maybe the doses would you say that trying something different and an alternative method whether that be beforehand beforehand, whether that would be finding people to speak to I think your take on it I think um, so because I've over the last year or so I've been really open with my own um, situation around people that I know people have come not come to me but have opened a dialogue yeah. So people that I would never have thought was suffered with things or were on yeah. antidepressants or anything, 
I, maybe nobody else knows that they they are. Yeah. We. I've learned. It's a common their, ground, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. So I've learned about their story and mm. and um, I think what happens, unfortunately, because there is a lack of maybe therapists, which would be the you know some some sort of talking therapy. Mm. Um. For you, if you're in a bad place and you go to your GP, usually the first thing they'll do is say, "Have try this, mm, prescribe you something, mm, prescribe you something," because you're looking at waiting lists of X, Y, Z, up sixteen, eighteen weeks. When after I took the overdose, they said I'm looking at a twelve to sixteen week waiting list for some sort of talking therapy. Mm. Not the people who are actually doing its fault it's just that there's there's not enough yeah um and i think the thing that you have to remember is that what i said to your fear is everyone is slightly different mm. some people don't probably are on medication that definitely don't need to be on medication yeah some people will need to be on that medication forever it really does it depends on that individual. I am now currently off my medication after having different courses of different treatments and things, which we'll talk about. But I think when it comes to the mind and psychiatric care, it is about the individuality, mm. which I don't think within the primary care of NHS is is allowed to happen. Mm. So you th- a GP is not going to sit there and they've got 10 minutes. They've got 10 minutes with you to say, for you to say what you think. The easiest thing is to say, here you go. But also, this. Yeah, and it's also it's a difficult situation because like you're saying, within the NHS, it's almost that time, that they haven't got given that time frame, but they're given alternatives to give which are prescribing certain medications yeah. without mm-hmm. actually the implications of knowing that individual and knowing mm-hmm. how that may or may not work for them. Yeah. Um, and and then the individual goes away almost thinking okay I've gone to my GP they've prescribed this and in their head it may be a case of why is it right now I want this to work why is this not working and then like you're saying in your case it didn't work for you you ended mm-hmm. up going on another drug and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden they're in this cycle of almost like a dependency on, on the, the actual the, antidepressant where there's not necessarily tackling the root cause which could what? be a vast amount could be anything of anything it could be like you said like your story it could be childhood trauma Mm -hmm. um, it could be relationship struggles it could be your you know stress from your job it could be a vast amount and that's where i think sometimes i don't know a lot of these drugs are not it's it's almost like technology it's i don't know if they'll be able to fully catch up with the actual cycle of what may be causing the trauma so for if I talk about my experience with the medication, I think there was a point when it um, helped me. Mm. I don't know if that was just that it did make pharmacological changes in my brain or if it was just a, from a psychological standpoint. Mm. But I can say that within myself, I felt that it helped me. But it wasn't until I had the talking therapies that I really felt that I was improving yeah so from my own personal point of view it is having that it's it was the talking therapies that helped me get through the things so my a1 would be to have a talking therapy before having the medication but that's just my personal experience well that's well that's interesting because looking through um and doing some research on again a vast amount um and again people family members as well um it's a long history in my family um on my dad's side that there is um depression and bipolar in the family Mm -hmm. um so again again i've got um siblings who have bipolar um so it's something that i take a lot of interest in and that um I was doing some research on this before I had you on and Mm -hmm. just going through, you know, I guess you you can call them celebrities and you've got like Robbie Williams um, suffers with anxiety, depression, Stephen Fry, bipolar, David Walliams, depression, fear being alone. 
um, Catherine Zeta-Jones, bipolar type 2 disorder. And then you've got J.K. Rowling, who's obviously the author of Harry Potter. Yep. And this one is what stuck with me um, because all the others had different types of, um, again, uh, treatments. So whether they're, um, they spoke about using um, antidepressants, some of them spoke about doing different types of therapies. But this one is similar to what you said in terms of talking therapy. In J.K. Rowling, um, contemplated suicide um, and before anything else she was prescribed cognitive behavioural therapy yep. which uses counselling to help her negative thoughts and speech therapy. So that's that's quite an interesting take that again obviously you've personally gone through that mm. and one of the biggest authors or if not the biggest author the in the biggest world author, yeah. it's gone the through, biggest character author, yeah, yeah and it's gone through that but the thing that worked for her wasn't um, necessarily you know a it was that emotional connection it was and i think like you were speaking at off there it's the social side isn't it? i think oh, somewhere yeah. we are missing whether it's feeling like we're part of something whether it's a case of again feeling like you haven't got necessarily the social group that you can discuss this with um whether they might you know take offense whether they might again because they might be going through that so sometimes mm -hmm. when people open up other people can be defensive and you know not be open to what you're saying um but this is i think that's such a i think a key issue because we are such social creatures really if you look at it we all like to post stuff so we all like to receive stuff from people whether it's a like whether it's a comment from someone yeah but we're taking away that social side of the actual engagement, whether it's, you know, apathy, empathy, speaking to people, engagement. And I think that's getting missed. And that, and like you spoke about, could be a very good way of helping people. Definitely. I just don't know whether we've got the manpower or if not necessarily whether we have. We have got the manpower or whether it's a case of people are taking that side of things seriously in terms of a way of helping people mm -hmm. as opposed to just give people the medication. The medication. Right. I think um, definitely having having an emotional connection with someone to help you bring you out of those places, that, yeah, it was the biggest thing for me. Mm. Um, not... Not because I didn't have... Okay, so that was with my therapist. Mm. I had people around me. Yeah. I had my family, my friends. Here's some. My mum. I'd. She's, I've always been really close to my mum. Mm. But there were things going through my head that I didn't want to tell my mum. Yeah. Because she's the person that's closest to me. And if I tell her these things, I don't want to upset my mum. Mm. You know, of course she was like the, she's the person that she's the person that you think you go to or mm. she even I know that she wanted me to go to her yeah but it was almost in a weird way I, I felt like I was protecting her by yeah. not saying this so I had to find somebody else yeah of that, course and for me luckily that was with my therapist but you know, it, might, it might be your friend or your that's such a yeah. That is such an interesting point that you raised because I I had a similar um, similar situation when I was about twenty one yeah twenty twenty one mm -hmm. I can remember it quite clearly. Um, I remember uh, going through phases of football and you know obviously like on a football pitch yeah, I, yeah. I switch a little bit. And <laughs> people say I can be quite angry, but I I, I tend to disagree and tend yeah. to say it's very controlled. But um, other way. It, I was getting very. Uh, I was in a place where after losing games after games after yeah. games, I was getting very uh, down. Very, and it got to the point. My girlfriend at the time, um, she would check my results, and if you know, if I'd lose Saturday, she wouldn't see me. She would say, "I'll see you Sunday." We just got to yeah, that yeah. point. It was just really bad, and it, it for me it was um, a point where everything else after that from the football side started creeping into my actual life everyday and then it, life. everyday mm. life and then it it got to a point where i was down and when i was seeing my girlfriend at the time it wasn't um quality time together i was very much at a point where i was there but i wasn't there yeah um and i think she could pick up on that and i remember one day coming home after a game um driving back 
I think it was maybe, uh, I want to say Dorchester at the time, Dorchester away, and I think we lost 1-0, they scored in the 95th minute, something like that. I remember just at this point, I was just very down, and I was just like, right, I just, I knew I just wanted to like give up football, and just weren't in the right place, and I remember just getting in and just saying to my mum, I was just like, I remember coming in, and I was like, have you got any calms I think they were you know yeah, like yeah, the, the minutes and they help you sleep those yeah days. so and I remember saying to her and then she was just like why do you want calms and stuff like that and I just said just because I'm just feeling like very down at the moment um, and it, it was almost again I could, cause like you were alluding to earlier I can't mm. I couldn't necessarily or didn't want to open up how I was feeling I was just like I'm down I'm, I'm very down yeah. and then it got to a point where I was like no, seriously, I'm, I'm I'm just feeling very, very, very depressed all the time. Like, I need these calms. Mm. And this was like six, seven years ago. And I don't think at the time she really um, maybe understood how down I was um, and almost sort of gave me the calms. And, I didn't, and it got to the point where I didn't even actually take them in the end. I think it was, for, for me, I think it was a case of more of a, a case of having to relay what I was feeling to someone yeah. and saying, I look, like I am actually down. I have to say this to you. Otherwise I'm going to break. Yeah. And that's, I think, and the once I got much. that off my chest, I I felt like I didn't need to take the calms. But then, then for me, the process and which is still ongoing with me is a case of figuring out what my triggers were yes. and what my thoughts were that were relaying to the triggers. So for me, it was a case of, right, this is something that I'm going to have to work on. Otherwise, you know, it could potentially ruin my life or ruin everyone who was around me. And it did ultimately affect, you know, my, it, it affected my um, previous relationship because I didn't feel I was good enough. Yeah. And I went out and did things that I shouldn't have done. Um, you know, I didn't feel like I could progress in the relationship that I was in at the time because, again, I didn't feel like I was good enough for the person. So I went and did stuff. So that was a big, um, and I think that, you know, the the actual, you know, the breaking point for me was actually when my ex at the time ended up finishing stuff because it actually forced me to then really take a look at myself and really figure out where, where I was at and yeah. what I needed to do. And that point of, I don't know, I guess, not knowing was a... Uh, was actually a, po- a a good turning point for me. So, in yeah, that moment, sort of after you broke up and you were trying to work out, what did you do? Was it just? A- <clears throat> um, well, it was a five five year relationship, so it was quite a long relationship. Intense, and I, yeah. and I initially, I I definitely came from the standpoint that I was resentful. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, I was very resentful. Um, I also came from the standpoint where I wanted to get her back initially, obviously, you know, trying little things yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know, like anyone would do in that situation. Um, but initially I knew that I wanted to, I've always wanted to go to America um, and the opportunity again, whether you call it fate, whether you call it universe, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. One of my mates um, was working in America and messaged me at the time, literally, I remember it as clear as day. It was two days after we split up saying there's going to be an interview process in Colchester for a company working in America. Do you want me to let them know? Are you interested? Two days. Coaching. Coaching. Two days. I've always wanted to go to America, whether it's play, coach, whatever. Two days after, got this uh, message on Facebook from my mate and I was just like, yeah. Without any hesitation, mm. I was like, yeah. But then when it got closer and closer, because it was like a month, two months away, then it, when it got closer and closer um, to the actual interview stage, it, then the thought started coming back in of, um, you know, am I good enough to, you know, pass the interview? Am, yeah, you know, what's going to happen? Am I good enough to, you know, work in America? Am I good enough to, like, coach these kids? Whatever. Everything started coming back. And then um, I remember one of the one of the girls that I used to work with at, at JD, she was just like, well, you ain't got nothing else to lose, have you? It's literally just blunt as anything. She's like, you ain't got nothing else to lose. Your missus split up with you. You got nothing else on. You hate football. Why not? So I was like, sometimes you just, some, do you know, just sometimes like, you just need to hear things yeah. straight. And I was you just do. like, do you know what? That is, you've got, you're 100% right. So I went to the interview and then pretty much, I remember I had a game in Lewis, so Brighton way. Yeah, yeah. I remember I literally had, uh, yeah, so I had that, 
uh, game on that day and then literally went for the interview, first part, did the interview and they were like, we'll pretty much offer you a place after that. Um, and that's sort of the first sign, I guess, for me of work, like, of sort of trying to tackle things head on um, from there. And then it just got into other little things from then on, sort of reading books. I, I never read a whole book until I was, I remember, yeah, it was must have been 21. Yeah, so I never read a book. Mm until I was 21 so I was reading books like The Secret um, things like that trying to find different uh, things that might work um, in my everyday life um, bring in like the positive side of things but yeah it was just um, a case of that but again just going back to the whole point I think it was just a case of um, from my side it was actually just releasing what I was feeling yeah, and getting that out I think sometimes as well um, even though person that you might not be talking to might not fully understand it i think if you can release that that is a a, again it's sort of like the mask isn't it you're releasing everything that was off your shoulders and you know what you've been holding in is then fully released and even to this day there's so many things that you know um i do that i know right i need to reverse that reverse engineer it otherwise i know it will eventually put me into you know that negative mindset continue along the the path yeah um and there's still times now where you know i'll I'll do certain things but i think that's just the whole progression of life really we're not going to be people who are sat here and perfect that's the whole that's the thing as well nobody nobody's that's the whole point of the time no but what you were saying about just luckily i feel myself you we've got people around us that we can openly Mm. talk to yeah now now i mean I, i saw my therapist on monday for the first time in months mm. just because i knew that i'd starting to feel a little bit something wasn't quite right yeah. there's someone that i could offload to even though i speak to my i've got friends and and my mum and things and i speak to them but i just wanted to go back and to that sort of comfort area where i yeah where i can 